Hello everybody, it's Donnell McAdams and I'm here today for our, what I'm calling Live at Five because where I'm at it is five o'clock. Now for some of you I know it's a lot different time because we've got people uh, chiming in from all over and we'd love for you to tell us where you're viewing from and give us some um, input, some thumbs up, some love and questions obviously. I have my daughter Megan with me here today and she is going to be watching those questions because we're going to be talking about let's get started and we're really starting from the very basics. Now I know some of you, you don't need the very basics but I'll bet you'll learn a thing or two as we go along. So one of the things that I want to talk about obviously is getting the machine ready to get started and what I'm going to talk first about is one of the things that I find people have had some issues with and that's on some of the machines they have a free motion setting that keeps the foot hopping so when they select free motion they end up with their foot hopping up on top of their templates so I'm going to address that first because I think it's something that is keeping people from having success so as I've watched on some of the um, other uh, Facebook pages, I have noticed some questions about it. So mainly, the ones I've come in contact, that would be the Viking sewing machines. And so although I'm stitching on an Epic today, I'm going to talk about it as if it was not an Epic. So in the Viking line, the Epics and the Brilliants have their own settings, so you have a ruler work setting. And those machines actually have a specific foot that works for them and I'm not even seeing mine right now I'll try to locate it here oh I know where it's at um, I'll get that here in a second but um, they have a specific foot now you'll notice the foot I have on here is the westerly foot and I want to show you how to get that set up because that is the whole idea on the machines that are not the epics and the brilliance again the epic is, epics and the brilliance will use the foot that comes from Viking and it actually has a part number. It's 9205080096 and it's called the Free Motion Ruler Work Foot. And so you can get that foot for your machine. We're having technical difficulties. Are we still looking at or not? I think we're having some technical difficulties. If you're getting this okay, can you give us a thumbs up? I can zoom in and out on there and tell you. Let me see what I can check here. Do my zoom in. It won't let me zoom in or out. So are you hearing us okay out there? Can someone answer? Okay. So back to what I was talking about. This is the ruler work foot that is the generic. It's the westerly foot. All of the Vikings use a low shank foot. The only machines that you cannot do in the Viking line um, are the ones that have the slant shank on them. So it's like the one plus, the 1100, the number one, and those machines. The rest of them will all use a low shank. So while I'm talking about that, I want to tell you how you would set this up. So on the machines that, and remember, I'm talking specifically to those who have Vikings right now, not the Epics and not the Brilliance. You are going to go into your machine and you are going to go into the settings tab and you're going to go into the settings that allow you to, number one, turn off the sensor foot. In other words, that beautiful feature that you have on the machine that allows it to sense the thickness of the fabric. We don't want that happening. That's what's causing it to pop up and down. So you're going to turn that off and then you're simply going to find where you can lower your feed teeth. And so you might have heard that click there and that lowering the feed teeth may not be a button for you. It may be a tab on the front of your machine down in front of where the bobbin sits in or it could be on the back. You'll just need to locate where that is so you may have a manual setting. 
So another thing that I'm finding that people are having issue with, and I really hesitate to show you this, but I'm going to, because of the fact that it is something that really makes a difference. So what that would be is on the drop-in bobbins down here, you would take out this cover slide. And after you've removed the cover slide, however it is that you would remove, this is called a needle plate, you are going to do that. But make sure you know how to do it so you don't damage any parts. And this is going to come out. And what we're finding is is that if you will just take out these three parts, this part right here, and then take out your bobbin, make sure it's clean in there, but right around this hook area, there is a little shelf or ledge, and all you need to do, because this is what's called a carbon fiber hook, it builds up a bit of static electricity, and then it causes your thread to kind of skip because you can kind of hear it. And I heard somebody the other day who was giving a demo and I could actually in the demo hear their machine doing this. So what I'm gonna do is this is called TriFlow and you're not gonna use any kind of WD-40 or anything like that. Do not use that. This is a TriFlow oil that is a very clean oil and all I did was put a drop on this side and a drop on that side. Now remember, this is just for those Viking machines that you're having trouble with skip stitches. And so what I'm gonna do then is, this has a space across here that's like a big open U shape. That's gonna go in so it's right towards the back of your feed tee. Now this is not lint. So if you're thinking, man, she's got a dirty uh, hook there, that is a brush that actually the thread brushes through. So I'm putting this back down in there. This is normal, very normal. I'm sitting this, what's called a um, collar. You notice that it's like at a 45 degree angle and I set it in there. And if it doesn't drop in like that or you have to force it, you don't have it in the correct way. Now I would recommend if you've never done this, when you take your parts out, take them out and lay them in order so you'll know what goes back next. Because next what we're gonna do is I'm gonna set this piece in there and when I set it down, if these little tabs right here happen to be up on like this, it's not gonna fit in there and you certainly don't wanna force those tabs. So you're gonna make sure that you just lift this up a little bit like a little ledge lay this down and you can see those tabs are behind and you're going to take and push down and it's not an easy push to get that back in so at this point i'm going to return my thread making sure i thread it correctly and i don't break it off until i've put back in my cover slide and now i can take and break that thread off so if anybody has any questions on that you are welcome to email me because I can give you a short little five and a half minute video that repeats that process. And that way you're going to be able to see just that part of it. And please, please, please everybody remember that's just for a Viking that has some skipping going on. It may happen with other machines, but I've not had it happen. And I can tell you, it's not a fault of the machine. It's that we're doing things with the machine on a basis of fast speed motion and it's something that really calms that hook down so I've repaired machines for 37 years now it's not like I'm just guessing around at this I can tell you it works make sure that you use the right lubricant that was triflow oil It's a very clean Teflon that is not going to gum up your machine or anything like that so that's my little spiel on what works there so now I'm going over here and I've dropped my feed teeth and I just leave this machine set for a straight stitch. Now this is for the generic foot. If I was using the other foot, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, I would use the regular settings. Now, 
To get us started, we've got to have a nice flat surface. And what I have here is my wish table from Sew Study. And I hate to mention, but as I look around my room now, I've got like, I think four or five of these because I have one that fits all of the machines that I'm working on because I absolutely love having this custom cut cabinetry, so to speak. It's a custom cut table that fits right up to my machine. Now, when you get your machine, or excuse me, your so steady table, please make sure that you order table polish because even right out of the box, you're gonna need to have table and insert polish. And so what I'm gonna do right now, because my table needs it, I'm gonna put about a quarter size drop on there, or spot maybe is what I should say. And then I have just gone to the dollar store. They come with a little cloth, but I've got just a bigger cloth here that I went to the dollar store, and I just use it over and over and over. And so I'm going to clean this table. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna rub it on the bed of my machine. And then I'm just going to flip it over and wipe that down. Now I can tell you this makes a huge difference as to your work. Now the other thing is when you buy a wish table, you are going to get this nice big blue drawer and you can see I've got a lot of things in it. And what you're going to want to do is take that drawer. I hope I don't knock this over here. I'm gonna take this drawer completely out and I'm going to take where I have that polish residue left over and just run it down the two short sides of my drawer. Because when I do that, I'm going to make it so it slides in a whole lot easier. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is I need a glider. Even though everything is leveled here because we have leveling legs on it, we are going to want to cover this up so our templates don't hit on these little ridges and we're just gonna make all of that space so it's nice and smooth. Now the glider that I have here is the grid glider. It's my favorite. And I'm gonna take that underneath and these solid, well not solid, but heavier lines are gonna line up right there on my needle plate so it's straight out to the left and the right and I'm gonna take the one that comes down the front and I want it to be straight out the front. Now, you'll notice the nice large opening. That's gonna give us the option that later when we're piecing something, we can go ahead and leave this on and that's why we would want to line these up because we have a quarter of an inch mark right here and we can actually use that to guide by. So you can see there'll be a lot of advantages to having this. And every now and then, this is going to get to the point where it needs polished. And right now, this one needs polished. Before I polish it, I wanna bring this up and show you that this is a cling, so it just clings in place. But after it quits clinging, you're gonna want that to be restored. So the way that you do that is two ways. First of all, if you're in a real hurry, you can take a lint roller and rub it on there. But if you have time, the best way is to just rinse it in warm water. And you're just going to put it um, down in a basin or something and rinse it in warm water. But every now and then, you're going to want to put a little table polish. Sounds like someone's knocking on the door. I'm going to take that table polish and I'm going to put that on my mat. They come to you pre-polished and after a while that wears off. Now another thing I will tell you, many of you have purchased our brand new what's called circles and straights and it comes with a little yellow mat and it is um, one that you would want to polish right out of the box because that little piece that sticks on there that has the pen on it for doing the circles, that is very, very sticky, and so if you just give it a little polish, you'll be glad you did. It makes it easier to get that pen off. So we've got that prepared, so we're now ready to give our machine a test here so that we know that we've got the foot on correctly. Now, we have high shank, low shank feet, high shank medium, or excuse me, high shank long, um, 
Hi, Shank Special. Sorry about that. Live TV, I can't ed edit that out. And we also have um, a medium. A lot of the FOFs, because they have the IDT, take the medium. That's the only thing in our line that's medium. If you have a medium foot, you're going to be using low shank templates. So obviously, I have a low shank foot. I'm using low shank templates with mine. So the easiest way that I can tell you, and this really works almost without fail every time, is if you will put the foot on and leave it loose like this. You can see that the screw is holding it in place, but it's loose. Push it clear to the bottom. And when you do that, because I've already got my machine set up for straight stitch, I have turned off that auto sensor, I have lowered the feed teeth, I've put on my mat, I am now simply going to touch the foot down button, and when it goes down, if you'll watch here, this foot, because it's at its lowest, will kind of come up and set exactly where it needs to be. So you could see that screw move. Let me show you one more time. So this is at the highest position. The needle, or excuse me, the foot is at the highest position. And all I'm going to do is push my foot down. It's loose. And if I set this presser bar down, you could see how that adjusted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my screwdriver and I am not going to touch the foot, and I'm going to be very careful to keep it from moving from anywhere. And I'm going to tighten it, but I'm not going to super tighten it. Because what I want to do now is I want to test. And I'm not a free motioner, you guys. I do template quilting, so this is about as exciting as my free motion gets. And right there, everything looks pretty good. It doesn't look like it's skipping. But if it were skipping or shredding thread, that means that the foot needs to go down farther. Now, most people go the opposite way and they take it up higher. And when I say go down farther, the thickness of a simple sheet of paper is down farther and makes a huge difference. So if you were to call me up and say, hey, I can't put it down any farther, I'll bet you can put it the thickness of a sheet of paper down farther. And so when I put my nail and turn it upside down, I can barely get it under there. This is just kind of kissing the surface. And another thing that I will tell you that I've found is sometimes you simply want to take this foot and tilt it a little bit because believe it or not, that will make it go down farther. Now you wanna make sure you can still move your fabric. Mine's attached here, but I can still move it. And so what I'm going to do is my front is tilted down a little bit farther. This is the last test. Lower right to upper left. That is on all machines, even long arms. That's the most difficult direction to stitch. And so I'm going to go from lower right to upper left. You can see that I did not have any stitching skips there. But I can tell you it was a little hard to pull. So I'm going to loosen it. And if you watch, that foot just kind of said, ah, that feels better and raised itself. So I'm going to come back down this direction. And I'm going to go back that direction. And everything looks just fine there. So what I'm going to do at this point is tell you about my little secret on setting up for speed control. I'm just going to lower my speed to a medium speed, and I take the foot pedal on the back and turn it around, and so it's closest to me on the back side or the high side. And so that way, I'm simply going to press it completely to the floor, and that way I will have somewhat of a stitch regulator. Do we have any questions to this point? Don would like to know where to get the polish. The polish is a Sew Steady product, so wherever you're getting your Westerly templates, if they don't have it, they can order it for you. And as we all know right now, some of the stores are not maybe open on the, uh, to, the, to the public, but they will gladly take your order, and that can be drop shipped to you if they don't have it in their um, stock at this point. So I definitely recommend 
Um, your local quilt stores, that's the first place that you want to check. Second question, you've already answered this a little bit um, about getting the glider sticky again. So I don't know if you want to go over that or just if they want to refer to earlier in this video. Okay, if the glider is not sticking, and right now when I pull this up, you can probably see a little bit of, that's actually lint. It's not just like dirt, dirt as in, you know, dirt. It's, it's lint, and that keeps that area from sticking. And so when this gets a lot of that on there, it won't stick well. So you have two options. Take a lint roller and roll it over and be careful because it's gonna start falling, following right on the lint roller. So you have to hold it so it doesn't just wind up around the lint roller. Or you can rinse it in warm water. You really don't want to use any kind of soap or anything like that. All right, so I've got this foot on there and everything is set up fine. And so I'm gonna tell you about the other foot and I need to reach right over here and find that. There we go. I have this cute little container that holds things and if any of you have seen it tell me where it is because i don't remember where i got it but it has all my fun little things in it and i do know that that's where my regular foot for this machine is as you can see because i'm on the road i have a lot of different feet and this is my viking foot right here and so i'll put the rest of them back in there and again, if anybody knows where that's at, let me know. So now that I've got this one adjusted, I'm going to go back and I am going to show you how you would use this particular foot. But anybody that is working with a generic, what I would call the westerly foot, you are going to be able to do what I just did on your machine. So you are just going to leave it on straight stitch, lower the feed teeth, Get it set up like I showed you and you'll be good to go. Dawn has seen those at Michael's. All right, I haven't been to Michael's, but if Michael's has them, that is awesome because they're really nice to store things like your stitching line desk, your echo guides. I store a box of needles in there and really, really, really makes it a whole lot easier. Thanks, Dawn. So now that I've got this foot on, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going into my settings, and many of you have these on your machine, whether it's a Bernina, a Janome, uh, anything you can think of, a lot of the machines have this. So I'm going into my temporary settings, and I'm going to go to, uh, let's see where it's at. Since I changed it all up, it's now... There we go. So I'm going in on this one into my default settings and I'm going to tell it that I am doing free motion ruler work. And when I do that, it automatically lowers the feed teeth for me and it gives me a window that has a height adjustment and it also gives me a window, or I shouldn't say a window, a setting where I can lower that height adjustment because this foot when it's screwed on is not adjustable. So now when I go back here, I'm gonna go ahead and lower my foot. You can see that right now, mm, it's not going anywhere, but as soon as I start, I've got to say okay to this, I guess. Actually what I've gotta do is go back in and take those other settings off. There we go. That should do it. Patience with me here. When I'm doing two different things, I've got to take off the settings that I put on before that don't mean anything. When all else fails, turn the machine off and turn it back on. I've got too many things changed for the other, 
And so right now it's not letting me just turn those off. So I'm just gonna turn this back off and back on. Now you'll notice that my lights came on here. I've got my lights dim because I think you can see better. So when this comes back on, I'll dim those again. Any questions while I'm doing this? Go ahead and ask them. While I'm doing that, I'll, or waiting on this to come up, I'll tell you that I use a size 90 needle, and today I'm using a 40 weight thread. And when you are using your um, machine uh, needles, you need to know what kind of a needle you've got in there. You just can't start out. So when you're using 40 to 50 weight thread, what we have always in the past called, um, all-purpose thread you're going to use a 90 top stitch needle now sometimes people use a jeans needle sometimes when I'm having some fussiness I will use a 90 top stitch chrome needle okay let's see how we do now there we go so I've got to set this again with my speed down and I'm gonna turn off those lights so you can see the machine had so many different things from when I set it the first time that it was not letting me change that now. So that's why I turned the machine off. So that's gonna make it real easy for us. Now at this point, I'm still gonna test it and I'm gonna do that direction and everything is just fine. And if, you're, if you have any issues with setting up your machine, I really encourage you to give me an email, send so steady an email or something because we can work that through with you very easily. Sometimes it's just even FaceTiming with you to get it set up. And once you've set them up, you'll find that the next time it gets easier and easier. So that's the way we're going to set that part of the machine so that we're ready to get started. Now. I have a handout that I usually hand out when I'm doing an actual online or excuse me, an actual in-store class. And this shows the, um, I want to make sure I've got mine in the screen there so it can be seen. We're having trouble zooming in and out, so I can't zoom out right now. Let me check here a second. That'll be good right there. Okay, so on this, you will see that this is the basic ruler that we have, and our rulers come with stable tape. Now, this is a six inch ruler. In actuality, it's right here. This is what it looks like, and I'm gonna be using it in a second. And this is a piece of stable tape. And a lot of times when I go in to teach a class, they've taken the stable tape and put it right down the center. And all they've really done is created a teeter-totter that rocks back and forth from side to side. So you want to put your stable tape out around the edge like this. Now, this is half-inch pieces. You'll notice it's a little half-inch strip right here. And these are half-inch pieces. But I'm going to tell you, don't do what I did the first time. And that's where I took all my five pieces of stable tape and cut them into half-inch pieces. And 45 minutes later, I'm sitting there trying to pick the fifth piece off. That's obviously an exaggeration, but it's pretty true too. So what you want to do is get your templates turned so that the wrong side is up. And when I say the wrong side, maybe I should say the back side. But it's the side that you rub your finger across and you can feel the etchings. And the reason for you want to turn them right, wrong side up is then you can just cut this as you go and put these on. And when you're doing that, what you're going to be doing is you're going to have them all lined up. This is the others. I'm going to go ahead and cut my thread right here. But this is the others that come in the sampler set one, which is what most people start with. And so in the sampler set one, you can see that there are six templates here. And you're going to turn them all upside down so that you can then... Um, 
put those tapes on the wrong side. And you'll notice that they're in the corners here. You don't wanna put them where you're not gonna be able to see a line. For example, there's a line, but you can see it before it and after that piece of tape. Now, some people don't do this, but I like to put on this particular one, the six inch spiral, I like to put tape on both sides of that template because if you flip it over, you get a different direction. Now you'll also notice that there's some little um, rectangles on these three pieces. Those are what are called the gates. And so that's a puzzle-like piece. And you can see it on this template right here. And so if I was doing a design with this template, you can even notice I've got arrows on here because I've got a lot of designs where I use this line to stop or these lines to stop. And so if, you, if, I, if I've got this so that I need to move it and I need to take it out from around my foot, I can simply then pop this open and I can pull it out from the foot, put this back in, and I can move on. So I want to show you the tape that I use. It's just called RNK Embroidery Perfection Tape. Some of you may even have it because of the fact that it's used in In the Hoop Embroidery. And this comes from the RNK company and they do a lot with um, Alex Anderson and this happens to be one of the tapes that is not going to leave any kind of residue and it lasts and lasts and lasts. Sometimes, well all the time they come with um, just uh, a regular uh, scotch tape on it and that doesn't last very long. I've tried painter's tape and that doesn't seem to work for me either. So that's what the information on the front of this is about and those are the sampler set templates. Now what I want to go through with you right oh, now... Hold on, question. They want to know where you got your arrows because those are pretty cool. Okay, I will show you my arrows. This is something that's fairly new and I like it better than the glow tape and they're called g -E -Z, and they're by the GE um, Designs Company. You probably have heard of this. It's Gundren Elda, Elra. Anyway, it's GE Designs. Ask for it at your local uh, quilt store. There are three different colors in here. There's also a hot pink color. Mine must be hiding somewhere under there. But I love these because when I'm working on a template, for example, this is the spiral template. And there's a design I do where I stop right there. And so I can just put that on there and I know where to stop. And obviously you saw them that I had on here. And some of you may have seen my live last, uh, I guess it was last Friday, when I was at the Atlanta OSQE show and I showed you all the different things that, well not all the different things, but about five different things that you can do with this Spinning Wheels 36. And so those were important lines. And if you, know, if you want to take them off, they are repositionable, so you can take them off and reposition. So those are called ruler stickers. So ask for them at your local quilt store. They'll find them for you, and I'm sure they'll be happy to get them. So good question. Keep them coming. So as far as the things that are highly recommended when we're working with our uh, ruler work is we've talked about the tables. We've talked about a glider, the importance of that. Maybe you have a Supreme slider, and that's what you're going to use. That will be fine. Um, we also use what's called a crosshair grid. And so what I'm going to show you here in a minute is how I mark with this. But this is my crosshair grid. This is the eight and a half inch size. And it has eight lines that are actual divisions so that it is exactly 45 degrees in each of those. But you can actually move this and get up to 32 different lines. So I'll talk about that in a minute. I do want you to know that this is the eight and a half. You can get that also in a 12 and a half. Um, but here's my, my little spiel on that is you can always go bigger, you can always go smaller. You decide which one works for you. I'm using my cutting or my extension table here as my work table, and so a lot of times it's easier for me to go bigger than it is to go smaller. So I use this one a lot. So we'll talk about that in a minute. These also come in minis, so if you were doing like cornerstones, you don't have to use this great big template. You can use the minis. And we have three different points. So if I was doing like an Ohio star, I would want to use an eight point design. Some of you may have the class in a bag, which is the continuum quilt. 
that comes with a six point. So rather than this being divided into eight point, it's divided into six points. We also have a five point. So it divides your um, area up into equal divisions. So if you're doing a hexagon design, you wouldn't want to put an eight point something or on there. You would want to do something that was six points. So that's why you would use the six point ruler. And what that means is, instead of these being 45 degrees divisions, they would be 60 degree. So six divisions of 60 makes 360 degrees. So that's the whole idea on that. So that's what is a crosshair grid. The next thing is, I mentioned it a while ago, is the needles. And I want you to understand that the, the needles are very, very important, and I'm gonna tell you why. And the eye of the needle is going to be um, where all the action is. And this is for any sewing. So you can probably tell I'm a former home ec teacher. And so a lot of this, I could spend three hours talking to you about needles and thread and you would just be probably going crazy. That's enough information, Donnell. We don't need any more. I'm just gonna tell you enough to get you so you understand. The eye is where the action is. So if you have shredding of thread, it's because as that thread is coming down and making that right angle to go to the back of your needle, it is actually taking off a little bit of the metal on the top part of that eye every single time it passes through there. So after a while, it literally sharpens up the front of that eye and so then the needle says hey I'm sharp enough I can take off the outer layer of this thread and so that's why you have that shredding coming up to meet you now that's different than what I said to begin with regarding the shredding if you just put your foot on and you're trying to test it out that's a different shredding but this shredding is because the needle needs to be replaced because the eye has been damaged so I want you to understand needle size and needle, the thread size make a big difference too. And my machine can be finicky sometimes and it doesn't like certain brands of thread. And I'm sure you probably have the same thing. I'm not gonna throw my machine out and I'm not gonna continually complain to the repair person. In that case, it would be me. But I'm not gonna continually complain. I'm just gonna think of it like my kids. You know, if one kid doesn't like broccoli, you don't throw them out, you find something that they like. So it's one of those things that threads do have, um, they, they do have different properties and sometimes there's just something with a machine that it doesn't like that thread. Now, quality thread is important, but most everything out there now is quality thread. So when you find something that you really, really like, you're probably going to stick with it. I can tell you that there's some people that will only put cotton thread in their quilt and that's that's fine that's that's great i look at quilting quilting as an art form so i'll use whatever i like if i want shiny i might use polyester i might use rayon um, if i want more of a flat finish i might use all cotton there's just all different threads out there and you want to know that your needle is sized with the thread now according to needle sizes smaller size of needle you are going to have a smaller eye. Larger size of needle, you're gonna have a larger eye. But no, 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 thread couldn't work with the needles. If you have a thick thread, you have a low number. So if you have a number 30 thread, you're gonna be using a larger eye, 100 or 110. If you were sewing, let's say piecing, and you were piecing with 60 weight, which I highly recommend piecing with 60 or 80 weight thread, I'll tell you in a minute why, but that's going to be a size 65 or a 70 needle. So you're going to make sure that you are using the right size needle with the right size thread. Now why would I piece with 60 or 80 weight thread? Because that is a finer thread with still good strength and it's going to allow you to have a flatter seam when you press it so when you're doing template quilting you can go right over the seams. It makes it so much easier to do your template quilting when you have pieced your quilt with 60 or 80 weight thread. So for some of you, that might be something you've never heard of, but it makes really a huge, huge difference. And if you think of it in the terms of back to the old wooden baby gates that we had, if you pulled them apart and through one of those openings, you put an inch dowel rod and you tried to shut it, 
it would not close nearly as tight as if you pulled out that inch dowel rod and stuck in an eighth inch dowel rod. Then you would be able to push it closer together. So that's the same way with thread. When you're pressing, if you have a heavier thread, such as a 40 weight thread versus a 60 or 80, that 40 weight thread is gonna leave a thicker seam than if you were using a 60 or an 80 weight. Now, another thing that you can do is you get one of these. If you already have pieced a quilt, or maybe you've done a block of the month that you're wanting to quilt, you're gonna get a good steam iron, you're gonna press your seams, and then on a nice flat surface, this would work just well as well, or as a table, but you're not gonna do it on your wool mat. You're gonna use what's called a seam roller, and you're just gonna roll right down that just seamed, steamed seam, and it's gonna flatten that out. So it makes it a whole lot easier to go over that seam when you are stitching. So that is a product that really makes life a lot easier if you're trying to flatten out already stitched quilts. So that's my little bit on thread and um, needles. We have a question before you move on from that. Okay. Um, what do you think is best for a bobbin, for like the bobbin thread? I usually match my threads if at all possible. Now, if I was using, uh, let's say, a sulky, ray or a sulky rayon thread on the top, I would probably use a 40 weight regular all-purpose uh, thread um, on the bottom, such as either a cotton or a cotton-covered polyester, um, just because that does add strength. A lot of people, they use the same bobbin thread throughout all the time, um, I'm usually trying to match my top thread. It makes your stitching look a whole lot better. Um, everybody has a theory on that. Um, I find that I'm probably going to be um, safer if I don't go to rayon on the top and the bottom. Um, it's just you're going to test it out and see what looks good and what gives you the better tension. And that's something that we're going to talk about in just a tech second too is tension. Any other questions? Um, you might get to this later. Is there any new ruler sets coming out, um, like in a quilt class, or is it a, qu a continuum? Um, I can, I'll address it right now. I know that real soon we are introducing our spring collection of templates, and they may already be out. I'm not certain. I am going to be doing a Facebook Live in the next uh, 10 days on the winter set because it has a heart in it and it has a lot of other things that are going to be good for all seasons and a lot of people were not even aware that there was a winter collection so we are going to show that so i do know that there is a spring collection and a couple of others coming soon another one that i'm going to be doing a facebook live on in the next week is the border set um, that's a set that's just been brought back it's a collection of five different templates and so we're going to be doing a facebook live on those so let's talk about now a comfortable chair. I can tell you that a chair is really important. If you're still on the dining room chair, it's time that you treat yourself. Um, get yourself a chair that's gonna be adjustable in height. Now, if that's not possible, or maybe you have a chair that's just not high enough, um, I would recommend you get a cushion and sit on, something to elevate you a little bit. I like to say I like to sew high, but sometimes you gotta watch where you say that because obviously, I don't mean it in the sense that some people might take it, but I do like to sit high when I'm sewing. So a comfortable chair, I can tell you my most comfortable chair when I'm doing this is one of those saddle seats. If you've never seen one of those saddle chairs, they do look like a saddle and they don't have a back and they are really comfortable for doing that. Um, an iron off or washout marker, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, right now I wanna speak about tension real quickly. When we are doing our ruler work, tension may not be something that is ever a problem for you. I hardly ever have on any of my, machine, my machines tension issues. So here's the best thing to say. First of all, make sure your machine is in good, clean shape. If it hasn't had a DNC, that's a dusting and a cleaning in a little while, it's time for you to open that up and get the little lint brush or maybe get the pipe cleaner or whatever you're using to clean out down there. 
you want to do that and get the machine nice and clean because it does make a difference. Look in your bobbin case. If you have a separate bobbin case, make sure there's not lint in the bottom of that because that causes your bobbin to spin differently. Another thing is check to make sure you're threading your bobbin correctly because that would be a tension issue. So now if everything is working good when you're stitching, as far as um, regular stitching, when you're piecing, everything looks good, you're probably not going to have any issues. But if you do, there's two ways to look at it. You do not want to get in there and mess with the bobbin case. You really don't need to do that. Everything is usually able to be adjusted from the top. If you start messing with the bobbin case, you're going to end up making your buttonholes bad, your embroidery bad, your regular sewing bad, and we don't want that. So here's the rule of thumb. If you have top thread showing on the back, a lot of times that's called eyelashing, that means that the bobbin thread is winning the war, so to speak. In other words, it's pulling harder than it should be. And the way you solve that problem is you are going to increase the number on the top tension so it gets more strength. It pulls more and it should even that out. Start by trying with like half movements. It makes it easier. You're going to make sure that you understand that a number is really not that important. If you, you say, oh my machine, they told me it should be on four and a half all the time, it doesn't matter you want good tension so you're going to increase it now if you have bobbin thread showing on the top before you start fussing around with the top number look into the bobbin case area and make sure you've threaded it correctly if it's not through the right threading then it's obviously going to show on the top because it doesn't have any tension down there to give it any strength to pull so make sure that you check to make sure your bobbin case is um, threaded correctly. And then if it's still doing that and the thread from the bobbin is showing on the top, you are going to reduce the top number because that allows the bobbin to have more strength to be able to pull it down there. So that's the little bit on tension. Now I want to show you a couple of markers so that you'll understand how easy this is. And I always tell my classes, if I had to fuss with my markings, I would never do this because I don't want to have to wash my quilt. I don't want to have to treat it, you know, like it's a little pansy and it's going to break and all that kind of thing. So this is a clover marker. So this is the one they call the Chaco pen. And you can see it has kind of this dolphin tip. And I have emptied the chalk that was in it out and I refilled it with Pounce Iron-Off chalk. Now I would show you a package of it, but unfortunately my package looks pathetic, and I'm gonna tell you what not to do so yours won't look like mine. So it comes double bagged, and in the bag is another bag. So here's mine, all right? And you'll see that it's even got it now that it's on there. But what you don't want to do is ever, don't ever, open the inside bag. You just want to go to one of the bottom corners and you want to slip off just a little tiny opening so that you can take off this top part. And I've made myself a little funnel and I just stick that in there and then I put my chalk in. Now remember, this chalk is like flour. It's not like salt or sugar, so you're, it's going to stick to itself. So you're going to want something like a, maybe a bamboo boo skewer or something like that to push it down in there. But that pounce iron off chalk, I'm just going to get my iron here to show you. And I never would iron on this, but you can see just that easily that line is ironed off of there. So it irons off very easily. No, it doesn't ghost. No, it doesn't come back. None of that stuff. So I'm going to replace this. And I'm going to show you that if you wanted more lines, you could turn this, line up the lines that you've already stitched with the etch line, or not stitched, but drawn, and then you can make more lines. So you can get a lot of lines. For what I'm going to be doing, I only need eight lines. So that's where I'm going to stop. So that's one way. 
Now another thing that you can do, because some of you are going, yeah, that's on black fabric, I can easily see that, but what about spring's coming and I'm gonna be using a light colored yellow or something like that? Well, what I do is you can get a different marker, um, a different colored one. I happen to have one that's actually yellow and you're gonna mix two teaspoons of the pounce with one teaspoon of cinnamon. Mix that up and put that in there. Do your design after you've marked it. Then get yourself at the dollar store a brush and scrub that cinnamon off of there. And then you can iron off the chalk. So that's another way that you can mark. I also have a piece of fabric here that has been prepped with um, Best Press. And so what I do is I put Best Press in a bottle. I'm trying to find my piece of fabric. It's purple, Megan. It's a purple piece of fabric. Well, just hand me another fabric right there. So what I would do is I would put Best Press on this fabric and I would press it. Now the reason I use the misting bottle, and I think you'll be able to see this, is when I spray this, don't be shocked, okay? When I spray this on there, it's a mist. It's a very fine mist. And if any of you have used Best Press before, you will know that when it sprays on, all that it does is kind of splots here and splotches there and misses here. And so for that reason, I like to have the mister. Mm -hmm. And the mister bottle is going to allow you to get better coverage. So I'm gonna set this back here. I went and ironed it, and I'm gonna put another layer of Best Press on there. And I'm gonna come over here and just trust me, I'm ironing on my wool mat. I have a TV tray that sits over here, and it has my wool mat and my little tiny mini iron on it. And ladies, the reason, and gentlemen, the reason I love my mini iron is because it never shuts off. So I get a silicone mat and I set my mini iron on that like that all day long and it never shuts off. So I have my mini iron working for me so that when I'm ready for it, it's not going to be cold. We all know what that's about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you here what some of you are going to say, oh, I've heard the stories about that. This is one of the Frixon pens. This is the original pen that has a metal tip. And when you would mark with that, you could see it kind of, I think you can see it, but people would do it again and then they would wanna really see it. So they would just scribble like that. Well, what has happened there is they have actually, in this case, marked so deep that it usually leaves, now this is a light fabric, but so it's not gonna ghost or anything on that, but it would leave a white ghost, which would come out when you wash it, but if not, and it got cold, it brought the color back. That's because that was a metal tip pen. They now have what are called Frixon markers. And the markers, one time across there, and you can easily see that line. The Frixon markers, you don't have to go a second time. And just about six weeks ago, I found we now have Frixon fine lines. So you can see the difference there. So the Frixon markers, because I have these on a layer of best press, when I do this, no matter what color it's going to be, it's not going to ghost because what I did with the best press was create a layer or a barrier to keep my ink off of my fabric. It's actually on the best press, which is actually a barrier, and it keeps that from causing a problem. So I can tell you with just the certainty that I have because I've used it a lot, this will work, but I would tell you, give it a practice yourself. You saw that I sprayed Best Press on here with a mister bottle because the mist is very, very fine. And so you're gonna get about a third more usage out of your Best Press by having it in one of the misting bottles. It just makes it so it lasts longer. So that pretty much covers 
all of the different things. It's nice to have a machine that has the needle down. And I also like to have a machine with a cutter. Now, when I'm doing a project, I'm certainly not using a cutter because I'm gonna show you how easy it is to bury your threads. But when I'm practicing, I like to have a cutter. So I'm gonna show you a design here and I'm going to push that thumbtack through the middle. I'm gonna take it out and I'm gonna push it up from the bottom. So it's dead center in there. And now I have my thread through this and I'm gonna show you what happens when you don't because this is something that I fussed with and then finally got smart. So when I start, I want that thread through that loop, the, 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 the uh, round circle here. And so when I do that, and I can't get that to come through there, it's touching my fabric, and if I just pull my fabric to the side, I'm gonna get a hold of that. So what I wanna show you, have several different templates, and what we can do with those templates. So I'm gonna set the spinning wheels 36 right on there. I'm gonna come into this A. You can see there's an A and a B, and that thumbtack is right between there. That allows me to have spirograph for quilters. It's gonna spiral right around there and stay right in position. So I'm gonna come in here. I'm not gonna show you how to tie this one off. I'm just gonna show you how it's stitched. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to start stitching and you can see here, I've got this line out of the top of this point lined up with what is the top part of that um, template and so I'm going to stitch and at the top here I'm going to I need to tell my machine I want my needle down so I'm going to tell it needle down I'm going to just trim this thread for right now but hang on I'm going to show you a fun way and an easy way to secure your threads so I come back to B now what I didn't say was how I placed my hands on there so I'm using my thumbs right here on the edge. I've got these two fingers on this particular template there, and I've got my last two fingers out on the sides. Now what I find when people start, they do one of two things. They either press too hard, I call that man hands, or they don't press hard enough. What I like to call it is fairy fingers. In other words, you're just gonna kind of set them down there and you don't press too hard. So I'm gonna to go to the next line. My B has now become A. And now, if I don't rotate my fabric, I'm holding it just a little bit differently. I've got this finger and this thumb here and this back here. Nothing really back there because if I do go back there, I'm gonna hit my hand. So I'm just using it like this. And again, remember, that speed is a medium speed and I'm flooring it. So that's all the faster it's gonna go, and that's what allows me to get stitches that look more even. So what are you going for? Really, you want it to look pretty much like what a 2.5 stitch length would look like. And I do wanna tell you, almost every time I teach this class, someone says to me, what stitch length? And a few people snicker. Really, that's not a stupid question. That's a great question because some machines have their tension regulated according to what the length is. So it's always best to just leave your machine set for two and a half because many of the machines that are electronic are sensing according to what stitch length. So that is actually a great question. Now you'll notice that I'm not turning my fabric I always tell my students, if you're getting your shoulders into it, you're getting way too much out of it. So we're actually not driving our fabric, which means this, back and forth. We are pushing top to bottom and side to side. I'm going to finish this up. And then I wanna show you what I call the basic nuts and bolts of how this all works. So for this time, I'm just gonna go ahead and use my cutter so that you can see the design. I'm gonna lift my foot up and you can see now what that looks like. 
And if I did this a couple times, you probably couldn't even tell where I started and where I stopped. And that's the whole idea. So I want to tell you how you can do that when you're burying threads. So I'm going to set this template aside and I'm going to use my straight edge and I'm going to use my chalk marker and this is what I always start out with. So I went ahead and did a design because I wanted you to see how they look, but I want to show you exactly how highly engineered these templates are. So what I'm going to do is use this same template. I'm going to straddle my line here and I'm going to put the foot down. So when I'm looking inside here, I'm going to be able to put that needle dead center. Now that's something else I failed to mention a while ago. You may need to center your needle when you're using a westerly foot and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you've put a generic foot onto your sewing machine so you might need to center it. So I'm going to go ahead and lower my needle. It's right now on that line and anywhere I place my template. It's a quarter of an inch from my needle. So what I want to do is show you a spacing gauge because this is something that if you are purchasing things, you want to make sure you get one. And I've got a little lanyard on mine so that I can hang on to it. We also have lanyards that look like this. And this is one that goes around your neck and you can actually put your spacing gauge on here. I have my um, smart um, stick on there. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go ahead and press that button and then you can take it off to use it. So if you had your spacing gauge on it, it's around your neck, you use it, and then you can put it right back on that around your neck. It's also great for scissors and things like that. So that is, that is two ways you can keep track of them. Now I just happen to have a spacing gauge that is of a different color because it's easier for you to see when I'm doing videos. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the quarter inch side. So I have an eighth, a quarter, a half, and a whole inch. And I'm going to take that quarter inch and I'm going to set it here or set it here. It doesn't matter because back to the days of your math, two points make a straight line. So now I've got a quarter back there, I've got it up here, and when I come along my line, I am now a quarter of an inch away from my template. Now I'm gonna go across the bottom, I'm gonna turn this so it's a little easier for you to see, and I'm gonna set this up against there. Now I'll tell you what I normally do is I have an 18 by three inch piece that has already been quilted up a bunch. It's just 18 inches long by three. And I actually set that right up against my fabric because I don't want these pieces of stable tape on here. But since I don't have that right handy, I'm just gonna use another piece of fabric, which you could do too, but it allows you to then still be in charge. So it's just gonna slide right across there with you. Now, when I get over here, I want to get right back there. Can we see that on the camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I want to get right back there to where I started. And I will tell you, I had my templates and my spacing gauge for like six months before I knew this was actually something to use. I don't know why, but I just didn't realize that. So I'm going to set this at an angle with the one corner against the stitch where I want it to go and it's going to meet up so that the flat side here is against the flat edge of my template. And you can tell probably by my voice that I'm leaning down and looking underneath there. And so now when I stitch, I am going to get right back to the spot, the spot that I intended to get to. Now just so that you can see that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna to touch my cutter and you can see now this stitch is a big, this is not actually here. I didn't mean to get, so there you can see that I got right back to where I started. Now I wanna show you how you can echo. So if I know, because I've been told, and you know because you've been told, that our foot is such that the needle is a quarter inch from the edge, I'm setting the edge right next to that line 
I'm putting the straight edge on the line and I'm going to stitch right down to the bottom so that the front of that metal is right on top of the line. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to get my little piece of fabric here. And now when I go to the side, when the side touches, so I'm touching right over there, I'm going to turn this and I'm going to line that up and I'm going to go to the back. And when the back touches, I will stop, I shouldn't say the back, the side, and then I'm going to come back and I will get right back to where I began because I used just the quarter of an inch built into the foot. Now I'm going to turn this sideways like this so that you can see how I would use the curved side. And I'm going to go around and I'm going to stop and I'm gonna swing this around and I'm moving it just because I wanna keep it in the camera's view. I need to get right back to that point right there. So what I'm doing is I'm allowing that quarter of an inch so that now there's a quarter of an inch spacing so my needle is gonna hit right in that spot. So anytime you're working with this, you're going to be able to put it where you want and end up in the right spot. Now, I'm gonna take my thumbtack out because I just now put my hand down on it. That didn't feel so good. But I need to put a vein. Let's say this is a leave and I wanna put a vein down there. I'm not gonna stitch clear up to that point, but I am gonna use it as my measuring spot. And so I'm gonna stitch up the vein. I'm gonna stitch back down a little ways and I'm going out to the side. Remember, I'm flooring it, but I've set it to medium, so I don't have to worry. I'm just getting my hands going to match that speed. I'm right on the line, and I'm going to put this against, and I'll come right back to that spot. So that's the way that we can use our spacing gauge. We, I, it's almost like it's another um, hand for you. So what I'm going to show you next, I'm going to go ahead and just cut this thread. Well, as you're moving to the next one, Gina is so excited that she gets to buy something now besides toilet paper. Awesome. And yes. Jill can also see her bank account going away because of all the cool stuff you've been well, showing. Well, it's a lot of fun. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this previous design and I'm just going to mark out here, in this case, an inch away from where I finished. And I want to show you how we would use that spacing gauge. I'm going to put my foot up just because I want to be able to put my fabric underneath there. Any other questions while I'm doing this part? If anybody wants to spend the night, I usually sew until about midnight. We can just keep going, but I'll try to wrap it up here in the next few minutes. But what I've got here is I marked this an inch away, and I am going to use this particular template. Oh, you got a funny for that one for staying up late. Oh, okay. They do too, probably. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one spot, doesn't matter which one, and I'm going to put my needle down. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop my foot, make sure I'm dead center, needle down, and this time I'm gonna show you how I secure my thread. So I'm gonna bring the needle up and bring the foot up. Now I cut my thread last, so when Ooh, I pull this up. On. Sorry guys, it turned the wrong direction, we're good. So when I pull this foot up, my thread is really short. So I get a tweezers, the curved tweezers, and I pull that thread out. But if you had been working on this, that bottom thread would be long. So what I'm gonna do is repeat the process. I'm gonna put my needle down, my needle up. I raise up my foot, and this is what is called flossing the thread. I take it and I put it around my left pointer finger. I take the tail of it and just pull it underneath there, and that brings the bobbin thread up. Now, can you do that again? Because I could not zoom in, and now I'm zoomed in. Can you try All that right. again? So I will pull it out here. Sorry, guys. We're trying a new technology, and it's not working the best for us. So thank you for being patient. 
So I'm going to needle down, needle up, put up the foot, finger here so that it's around that first finger and then pull underneath there and I pull my threads out. Now because I pulled it out twice, it's way longer than it needs to be, so I'll just trim it back to about eight inches. And I'm not going to do anything with that thread again until I'm finished. So it's going to just lay out here to the side. I'm going to go ahead and put my needle back down in that spot. So that needle is centered right in that little crosshair. It's right over there. Now I'm going to sew to this spot. But if I sew to this spot by lining up my ruler at that spot, it's not at the same place. So that's where the spacing gauge comes in. I'm gonna take my spacing gauge and allow a quarter of an inch. So now when I come over to that spot, my needle will land right there. So I'm gonna stitch over to there and I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna rotate and I'm going to measure just like that. And I'm going to go to the next spot. I'm gonna try and keep this so that you can see how it's going around there. And some of you may think she's making a circle. Well, it's not exactly a circle. You'll see in just a minute. And I can do this on a lot of different things. Not just this particular design. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back to this and I'm going to go to the next one. And we're almost back to where we started. Barbara would like to know where, the, where can you get the starter kit? You should be able to get it at any of your local quilting shops that are carrying this. It is a great purchase to just get what we do call the Ruler Work Beginner Kit. It's $175, it has your crosshair grid, it has your foot, it has the first ruler, this one that I'm using, it has the sampler set, it has the spacing gauge, and it has John, Janet Collins' book called From the First Stitch to the Last, which shows you like over 45 designs that you can use. Um, it's a very good investment. Um, if you can't find it there, you can contact me and I'll be happy to help you out to get that, that found. So now that I've gotten all the way around here, you can see it's not a perfect circle. It's not intended to be a perfect circle. But what I'm going to show you is how we can do more with this. So I'm going to take the same template here. Actually, let me take a different template. I'm going to take this template. And this is where I am actually going to put this on four corners of this design. Because if you can see, this is straight up and down. This would be a corner. So I'm opening my gate. And I'm just trying to show you all the little fun things. And this template has a line on the back that I'm lining up with my line that is drawn like right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around that. I'm done with that template, but I'm not done using it, so I'm just going to lay it back here and leave the gate open. And I'm now going to go to this line. So what I'm going to do is, because I'm better with my template in my left hand, I'm rotating everything, taking this arc, and now this time I'm going to be allowing a quarter of an inch out this way, because if I went this way, my line would be clear down here. So I'm outside of my arc. You just have to think, I need a quarter of an inch. And so now I'm coming to that exact spot. I'm moving to the next one. And kind of, you can't see what's happening, but you will in just a minute. And so what I'm gonna do is pick up that previous template. I'm gonna lay it back down here. I'm gonna line it up. I'm going to stitch around that. I can tell you there are so many possibilities and so many ideas. And that's why I wanted to do this get started. Because a lot of you have some of these products. But you're not successful yet at it because you had a little bit of a hiccup. Maybe even just putting on your foot. 
And so I wanted to make sure you knew what you were doing that way. So I've got one more here to do. And then I will take my template, put the, the, cro or put the uh, gate back on. I got one more stitch to line up. We'll go out around. And I will tell you when you're using these and you're on an inside template, if you'll just think of it as you're trying to push out of that template. And that way you can stay right up against the edge. Now remember, I have to go this direction to line up. And that looks like it's way more than a quarter of an inch. But straight to there is a quarter of an inch. And we're right back to where we started. And now I need to do the design again. Sorry about that. I dropped my scissors. And I know I'm going to need them real quick. We're getting some weird coloring going on, guys. I'm working on the lighting. So now... I am finished with this particular template, and had I had it out farther away, I could have put one of those on every single one, but I didn't need to take the time to do that for today. And I'm going to be back, and I'm going to show you how we tie off. Here are those two starter threads. Look how much we've done without having to start and stop. So now that we're back, I am going to raise the needle, I'm going to raise the foot, and I'm going to pull this out so when I go to cut my threads, I'm not only leaving a tail on my threads there, but I have a tail here. So I have three threads. One's a dark thread from the bobbin, and then I have two light threads. And so one of the other educators told me about cinch needles and they are side threading needles and they are great. And I have a new way for you to um, secure your threads. I used to use a curved needle and sometimes I still do, but this way works so much easier and you can see what we've done there. Now just imagine with your sampler set, I've only used three templates. You could have done that out here and you've got a, a, a beautiful design with not a lot of work. And so what I'm going to do is the side of this needle. Hold on. We've got to get, we can't see. Okay. We're going to get it so you can see it. Let me know when that is. I'm close up, guys, but it's a little blurry. It's as good as I can get it. I'm sorry. I, I can't see it. Hold on. I want you to be able to see this because this is really an easy and great way to secure your threads. Are we still blurry? Yeah. I can't get it zoomed out to where they can see. There we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is the side needle the side cinch needle, it has an opening, but the thing that's cool about it is this is the one out here, my needle's up and down here, and it has kind of a little place right here like that, so that when I put the thread in there, it stays in. So you can see I got all three of those threads threaded through there just like that. And so now I'm going to push them through the hole where the bobbin thread came up, and where I started, I've come to the back, and this is why I put dark thread in, is I wanted you to be able to see what we were doing on the back. So now I have four threads, two bobbin threads and two from the top. Now in the past, I would have taken this and I would have taken two threads, tied a knot together, did that twice, and then I would have buried my thread. But this is even easier, so I'll probably have to do it two times because you'll probably want to see it again but I'm going to go slow so that you can see what we're doing. Oh I skipped a step. 
The first thing to a knot is a loop. So I simply make a loop with my thread. So here's my tails, there's my loop, and I'm gonna stick the point of the needle through the loop. I'm gonna pull it back so you can see it, and I'm gonna stick that point right there where it came to the back. I pushed too hard. Right there where it came to the back. Now my knot will not make a knot until I pull the needle out. So I can take it and pull it tight against my needle and pull it right down to the surface. So I've got a knot on there, and when I pull my needle out, that knot has come about an eighth of an inch away. And that's exactly what I want. Because what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna put those threads in that side threading needle. Did you see how easy that was? Oh, so much fun. And then I'm gonna go right back in the same hole. My knot is sticking up about an eighth of an inch. I'm going right back in that same spot and bury my threads. My needle's coming out down here. And when I pull this through, I'm gonna go slow enough so that you'll be able to see it. I'm pulling the tails through. There's my knot. And when I pull it, it buries. So the actual knot is over here. So when I touch this, I don't feel a big old lump there. And on the front, I obviously don't feel a lump. The knot's secure, the tails are buried. It was easy and I just, it's my new favorite thing. So if you've been doing some of the other ways, you might want to convert to this. I will tell you those side cinch needles make it a real picnic. So since we're having some difficulties, I'm gonna show you two more things and then we will call it a day. So what I wanna show you here is the scallops. This is in the sampler set. And I'm gonna use my 12 inch centering ruler. This is a ruler that I designed and you can see that it has a zero here. And so therefore, when I am doing borders and I'm measuring, which is you know, another class that I do, I can actually center and work out from the middle. So I've drawn a line there. This is my scallop ruler or my clamshell. And on the template, I like to do a little bit of a, a tour of the template for you to see. On this template, in the top part here, there is a line that goes right through the middle. Now some of you may be thinking this is gonna be a squiggly line when I'm finished, but it's not because it's gonna bury down into that spot. So I'm gonna put that top line right on the line that I drew. Now that might not be a line that you need to draw. It could be a border that is connected. So it could be a seam line that you're just using. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come through, and this is one that once you get the hang of it, it goes very quickly, and you could use the other side as actually an all over, or if you were doing a mini quilt, this one could be an all over. We've got some questions. Are you ready for some? Sure. So, um, Kathy would like to know, what is the name of the needles used to bury those threads and knots? I was getting some samples to show you while she was asking that question. The needles are called cinch side threading needles. This is what the pack looks like. S-E-N-C-H, side threading needles. So if you just wanted to do this part of it, that shows you what that looks like. And this is a sample. You can see that this is pretty much like what I did before. And so this is how I, from the border, after I had turned this, I actually then went back and used that small scallop 
to put a little bit of a stitch around the outside edge. So that's a way that you can use that. Now, this is one that can be very confusing. You will notice that I stopped at the top of a hill. So we have valleys and we have hills. And so because this moves that direction, I had to stop at the top of a hill. And then I'm gonna take my template and just slide it over into the valley and I will be lining up the top line with my previous stitching. And I'm just going to work my way and stop on the top of a hill. Now, if I was going to fill this all in, I would just continue on. But I wanted to show you how I can mound these up and how quickly this design goes. And for those of you that are just getting started, I love my method of actually just putting the machine to medium. I'll turn this so you can see it. And flooring it because that's all the faster my machine's going to go. We have a question. When you showed this blue sample and it had that scallop on the edge, did you do that before or after binding? I actually did that after I bound it, and that's the one that I learned that I needed a piece of fabric. So after I had done the binding, and I used my Quick Easy Miter binding tool. Some of you may have heard of it, but this is the tool that I use. So I'm actually bringing my back to the front to get this perfect miter. And so after I did that was when I used a little piece of fabric. That's how I figured out I needed to do that. So that's when I put a piece of fabric here so I wasn't on my mat. I was actually still on fabric to be able to move it. So that's a great question. And if you look closely, all of the corners are not going to look the same. It would only be lucky if you could get them all to look exactly the same. So um, some things just are all but impossible. So you can see here, I'm going to go ahead and cut that. But that's what this would look like with mounting up. And if I use the other side, it's the same concept. There's a line right here that's a quarter of an inch from the bottom. And it's going to be doing those hills and valleys stopping at the top and moving up your template. Now this is the no normal way that I just did that. I'm going to turn this 180 degrees and I am going to go ahead and I'm going to line up the base of the previous with the top here. And I want to make sure that these are straight across. Now the only way I can do that is turn it right in front of me and then I'm going to push that up so that that line that we just did is, or that we were just referencing is now on the bottom. So with that, remember I turned it 180 degrees. I can now create a small little border like this. And I could do the same thing with the opposite side here. So I think our time has come and gone. There's a lot more that I would love to show you. Stay tuned the rest of the week. Obviously, we have several educators that are doing events like this. And I hope today has brought you some information that you may not have had in the past. My favorite thing, I guess, that I showed you today, well, one of the favorite things, was those cinch needles and how to secure that thread. So remember, we are on at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm not sure what time it is in England or Australia. I know we've got people watching from Africa. And I can tell you that I really enjoy sharing this information. Don't hesitate to ask questions. We are going to stay on here for just a few minutes if anybody has a question right now. I know they wanted to see that packet one more time because it was sideways and they can see it. Can they see it now? Cinch side threading needles. It's a cinch. That's the way I remember it. Any other questions? Um, Don't hesitate to ask. There's no foolish question. 
Well, it's not really a question, but Lynn is thankful that you showed your corners because uh, it gives her permission to not be so perfect all the time. Hey, I threw perfection out the window a long time ago. I can tell you, when I was in college, I had a professor that said to me, may you have students like yourself? And then I had one. And I decided that she was not giving me, that professor was not giving me a compliment. She was basically telling me, you're too much of a perfectionist, you're boring everybody else. So, hey, jump in there, do what you can do. Just remember the person that's criticizing you probably has no idea that what they're doing. And so it's only going to get more fun and better if you just keep practicing and dive in there with a project. In fact, one of the classes we're doing, the, uh, one of the, these classes that we're going to be doing this week and I'm going to be teaching is called Grab Two Fat Quarters and Let's Make a Project. And so I hope you'll join me for that one because it's going to be a lot of fun doing that project. All right, I think that's all of our questions. All right, if you have any more, don't hesitate. I'll be watching for the comments, and um, thank you for joining us. We're excited to show you more and more that you can do with your Westerly templates. So long for now. I'm Donnell McAdams. My daughter Megan is here helping me, and we will see you soon.